This is House Planning Help, episode 340. Hi there, I'm Ben Adam Smith, and this is the podcast for you if you're interested in self build or retrofit. I'm exploring what houses we should be building in the 21st century and trying to break down the major roadblocks that may get in our way. Coming up in this session, my guest is Andrew Jones, the VAT man, and we'll be finding out how you reclaim VAT on new builds and conversions. A special hello to you, though, if you're someone who's delving back into the archive, because we make these podcasts and we've been doing it quite a few years now. And it's very easy to start talking about things that are time specific and you come to listen all these years later and people do. So that's why I'm giving you the shout out here. But I do my best to try and create evergreen content, things that will be relevant, hopefully, for many years to come. However, today, this is quite a funny one because this is a scheme that hasn't changed for decades. I think since we joined the EU, just remember the whole stuff that went where we we exited the EU, that disaster. Well, nothing has changed. But as Andrew hints in this episode, it might be about to change. So I think we're going to put a caveat on this one and say, certainly we'll update the show notes as we can. Make sure you also check Andrew's website. I'm sure he'll be hot on changing and updating things. However, since it hasn't changed for 50 years, you know what these things are like. Sometimes it'll be another 10 years before they update it. So I started today's conversation by asking Andrew to tell me a little bit about his background. So for the last 12, 13 years now, I've been doing VAT reclaims on new builds under a government scheme called VAT 431, also known as the DIY scheme. I fell into it, really. When I left school, I went into construction, building and selling bungalows. And then, as it is in this country, there's a peaks and troughs in the the housing market and we were just coming over a peak and I felt it was time to walk away and I landed up getting approached by a local builders merchants to sell to predominantly self-builders, DIY builders, someone who who wasn't a builder as such, and the vast majority of my customer base would qualify under this scheme. So one day I was dragged into doing it as a favour for a chap who described me as clever, good with paperwork and a good organiser. And I did that for him begrudgingly, only because he had been very good to me, gone out of his way to give me orders every opportunity he had. And he was a very um, calm gentleman. And I heard him swear more about his VAT reclaims than he had throughout his build. And he'd had quite a challenging build at different times. So I could see that this was causing him stress. So I landed up doing that for him. And then uh, his uh, next door neighbour approached me. And it just somewhat evolved from there. Until one day I got to a point where I had 35 jobs in the house, couldn't answer the phone to people because I just didn't know where I was with any of them. And my wife said, look, one of these things has got to give. The selling building material somewhat run its course in my life. Uh, My life personally was changing in relation to having children and so forth and becoming self-employed and being able to work around that. It ticked all the boxes. And it's evolved from there to where we are today, where I land up being the expert at Grand Designs, the VAT speaker at places like the Home Building and Renovating Shows, which there are seven of them across the country, and the National Self-Build Centre in Swindon. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been a good journey. Yeah. Is there a logical way to go through this? Where do we start? OK, so if you create a new dwelling and it's for yourself or a direct family member, then in all probability, you would qualify for this scheme. Now, that can be a new build, or it can be converting a church, a chapel, a barn, converting the solicitor's office in town back to a family home. The dentist is retiring, there's no one taking the business over and it's becoming fashionable again now somewhat for us to move back into these inner cities where 25 years ago we were all moving out of them. The shops seem to be closing. It's becoming fashionable now in lots of these towns that we're moving back in again. So there's quite a lot of that going on at the moment. 
when we talk about renovation then because you mentioned converting from presumably one purpose yeah. into a home yeah okay so renovating a house unless it had been empty for a period of time which i'll touch on in a minute it does not qualify irrespective of how much you're doing you're trebling the size of the house you're taking the roof off and so on unless you meet one of these three criterias the house has been empty for 10 years or more it doesn't have to be you know back to rack and ruin but as long as there's a paper trail evidencing it's been empty for 10 years could have been that it's in the family it could be that the person's been in a care home and thankfully, you know, lasted uh, for many, many years after moving into the care home and the house just remained empty. Or it could be that for some sort of dispute or just the house just wasn't used. As long as there's a paper trail evidencing it's been empty 10 years, you can qualify for the scheme. The other option would be to an existing dwelling is that if the house was in such a state where it had to be taken down to the slab, down to the ground, bar allowing one wall to stand. But again, it's a bit more complex than just saying that. So if anybody ever did have anything of that scenario, by all means, reach out to me. But the other one, which is not that well known, which is only of benefit to a certain style of renovation, is if a house has been empty for two years, you qualify for a different scheme known as the two-year rule, surprisingly enough, whereby a contractor can do the project for 5% VAT instead of 20%. But it is what's deemed contractor-led which means there is no VAT reclaim system or anything. It's purely where the contractor charges 5% VAT instead of 20. It's fine for someone like me who can't put a screw in the wall, but if you're a DIY enthusiast or in the trade, it's not particularly great because if you go shopping for materials, the VAT can't be reclaimed on that front. It's purely a contractor coming to site to do work for you can do it at 5% under the two-year rule, which is different to the VAT 431 scheme, the DIY scheme, which we referred to just now. I've realised that we've jumped straight into this. Should we actually define what VAT is? Right, so VAT is on lots and lots of things that we buy every day. It's a stealth tax, I suppose you could describe it as, whereby... The money is passed on to the government on the vast majority of things that you buy, even when sometimes you don't realise. You go to somewhere like Tesco, probably half the stuff you buy, you spend £100 in Tesco, probably 50% of it was subject to VAT, which currently in the UK is at 20%. So out of that £50, HMRC would be passed £10 of VAT out of your spend. And petrol, all these types of things, I think there's a reduced rate on your... Gas, electric, the vast majority of things you buy in the UK is vatable, be it you notice it or you don't. But it's there in the background somewhere, chances are. And why do they give us these discounts or have these schemes? OK, so the th- mindset behind this is when we joined the EU back in 1972, we had to have a VAT type tax system in place. It was one of the qualifying criteria. So VAT was introduced. But if you were to buy a house, an old house through the estate agent, or buy a new house from one of the national house builders or a small developer, new housing does not have any VAT. So when you go and build your own house or create a new dwelling, if you go to B&Q, Travis Perkins, Juice and so forth, you can't just walk into these places and say, I'm building a new house, I'm doing a project, I don't pay VAT. It can't happen. It's totally open to abuse. And uh, how would they administrate it? And you know, it, It's just not going to work. So this, how the scheme works is it's split into two. It's known as 431NB for new build and 431C for conversion. It's very important you know the difference and which avenue you go because the rules are slightly different. Now, where there is sometimes a complication is we'll say someone is doing a barn conversion and they're adding to it. They're building an extension at the rear. I quite often hear it said, oh, yeah, I'm doing a new build barn conversion. 
Well, there's no such thing. It has to be a new build or a conversion. So the way that is decided, majority of the time, is by the wording of your planning. So if the wording goes something along the lines of conversion of existing uh, redundant barn farm building with extension to rear, well, it's a conversion. Right? Irrespective of the fact that half of it, if you're trebling the size of it with the extension, initially there's a building there and you're converting that building. So it would be a conversion. So the two different routes are, and why I was saying it's important from the outset, both will become zero rated at the end. How you get there is different. I'll do the simple one first, the new build. Any contractor coming to site to do work for you should not be charging you any VAT in the first instance. And that applies to the labour and any materials they use. So I'll give you an example where what I mean by that. No, I'll, I'll give you the list first of the ones that just reel off the top of my head. The ground worker. Uh, we will say a SIPs company if that's the route you go down just for discussing at the moment. The roofing contractor, the bricklayer who's putting the outside skin up, the window company. Then we get inside the carpenter, the plasterer, the electrician, the plumber, the granite worktop company. Then we get the painter and decorator. Then we get outside the landscaper, the driveway people, the tamakadam company. All these people, none of them should be charging you any VAT and that applies to the labour and any materials that they bring and use themselves. So it's a, a project price. Right. So when you then go shopping yourself, if you're more active within the build or your contractor is not VAT registered, so you don't want them buying the materials in that case because they would have to add the price including the VAT, because they're not VAT registered, they have no way of passing the zero rating on to you. So if you do land up using a non-VAT registered contractor, don't be put off, nothing at all wrong with them, but you need to be buying the materials in that instance. But for argument's sake, if you're going down the route of buying the materials yourself, then you would go to Juice and Travis Perkins, B&Q and so on, and you would pay the VAT as you would normally, but you retain the invoices for your VAT reclaim at the end. Then at the end of the build, which must be within three months as it stands today, although if you're going to be listening to this in 2024, there may well have been a change by that point. Within three months, as it stands today, at the end of the build, you must submit the VAT reclaim to HMRC and you claim back your 20%. Obviously, paying contractors VAT in the first instance is a disaster. Irrespective of Peter the plumber telling you, I'll give you a VAT receipt and you claim it back, it won't happen. The rules are they should not be charging you the VAT. This is obviously a key point, so let's just stop here and yeah. see if okay. we, we get around yeah. here. So if we find ourselves in that situation and we look at what's coming, we can see we're going to be charged VAT. Should they automatically just back down or could we still have a problem? No, if you back down and you pay the VAT, I'd be very sure that HMRC would not reimburse that VAT. So at that point, you need to decide... Do I want to just take the VAT on the chin? Chances are. Or do I give him the option of speaking to his accountant? If you want this job, you speak to your accountant and come back to me. I'll give you a couple of days to let me know if you're prepared to do it VAT free. Otherwise, you need to decide, do you take it on the chin or do you look for someone else? To be fair to contractors, at the end of the day, they're plumbers, electricians and so forth. They're not accountants. So I'm cutting them a bit of slack here. But you want to think about, do I really want to be dealing with someone who's got no interest in actually following the rules? But why would they want to charge the VAT? Is there a reason on their part? Because as a rule, they're told that everyone pays you VAT. And if they were to charge the v not charge the VAT incorrectly, then they would be liable for that VAT. So it's easier for them just to charge VAT just on be, everything. Just be safe, yeah, play safe and just charge everybody VAT. But that's not how the rules work. 
So I said that the um, conversions worked in a different way. So it seems quite general knowledge out in the marketplace that, oh, yeah, conversions are 5% VAT, more so than general knowledge in relation to new bills are zero rated. And that statement of, oh, yeah, conversions are 5% VAT is somewhat correct, but it is actually incorrect because conversions are also zero rated. It's just how you get there is different, which is why I was saying it's important to know which avenue you go down. So with a conversion, when a contractor comes to site to do work for you, they should be charging you 5% VAT, differently to where I said on a new build, zero rate. It's 5% from your contractors. Then, in exactly the same way, when you go shopping, buying materials, you pay 20%. So this time, again within the same time frame, three months as it stands today, you must submit the reclaim to HMRC. You claim the full 5% that you've paid your contractors plus the full 20% that you've paid for your suppliers. So again, you get all your VAT back, so it becomes zero. Very, very often when doing a barn conversion or a chapel conversion reclaim for someone, they omit presenting me with their 5% invoices and they actually say to me, yeah, so out of this 20% VAT, now I'm getting 15% back, aren't I? Thinking that the rate for their project was 5% VAT, which is correct in one way, but it's not correct overall. So then I delightfully tell them, you're going to get all your 20% back. Plus, can you find your contractor's invoices? Because you're going to get that back as well. Which then means the holiday they were planning, that cruise they were planning on, now becomes a round-the-world trip. So going back to new builds, we started our way going through that. How are we just collecting a pile of invoices as we go through and then doing it all at the end what's the process okay so the main places where people go wrong is you need invoices in your name personally so that could be you and your significant other or just you or just your significant other or no name at all what I mean by that is when you go to the likes of B&Q and Wix, you get these um, Tesco Asda style receipts and they've just got your credit card number at the bottom and uh, so on. Those are fine as well. What I mean is that problem occurs when your builder presents you with invoices and says, oh, yeah, you weren't here. I went and bought this for you. Or when a builder says to you, oh, you don't have an account at XYZ. Oh, go down, book it to me. It'll be fine. Yeah, it'll be fine in that extent till you come to doing your VAT reclaim. When HMRC say, well, these are not your invoices. We're not reimbursing you that. So the name on the invoices was something I feel I should mention at that point. So all you really do is me personally, I'd go to one of these hardware stores and buy one of these plastic boxes. And religiously, from day one, put all my paperwork in there every day. Every week, every bill I pay, it goes in there. So think of these bits of paper as every one of these bits of paper is a £50 note. That's a good mentality. So you're leaving that lying around there. That's a £50 note there. Put it in the box. Your money box. Your savings. Put it in there. So each invoice needs to be retained that you wish to claim on. And in today's world, a lot of these invoices come on your computer. We're doing a lot of ordering online and so forth. So printing off the PDF attachment is fine because you'll see in the rules it says HMRC want originals. So what they mean by that is they won't accept a 1990 type photocopy. And as it stands today, as I mentioned earlier, By next year, 2024, and you might be listening to this in 2024, there might be uh, a digital option. But as it stands at the moment, we have to submit the original invoices in paperwork format to HMRC. So there is no computer app or taking photographs of receipts on your phone and saving them in the cloud and so forth. You cannot do any of that as it stands at the moment. So they must be the original documents. So that's all the documentation. We're getting to what point? The end of our project? We've moved into the house? Or when do we want to deal with this? Right. You can only claim the once. And the ideal scenario, if funding goes well and the time frame and the build and everything goes well, is that you get the house signed off by building control 
You then have three months, which looks like it's going to be extended to six months to get the claim into HMRC. But let's play safe and we'll say that it's three months. You must get it in within three months from the date of your building control completion certificate. Now, one of the challenges there is, having done several self-builds myself, is that by hook or by crook, different scenarios and so forth, sometimes you have to move into the house, which then your local authority is knocking on the door asking you to pay council tax and so forth, or the funding's not in place, or the groundwork quadrupled in price and stole all your contingency and everything, and you couldn't quite get it finished, and you're now having to live in a partially finished property, this can bring its own challenges. There is an option of being able to reclaim the VAT before you get signed off by building control. Now, this is going to give you a lump of money, which may help you get the project finished and complete. And the way to do that is in England and Wales, there is a authority which banned your property. The banding for council tax of your property is not done by the local authority. It's done nationally. And you will get a certificate of banding from the organisation. And HMRC will accept that as one of your options in order to be able to submit the VAT reclaim. Now, it may well be that you didn't foresee this problem occurring and that you got banded for council tax a year ago. Well, you have to submit within three months of date of your evidence. If you get on well with your building control officer, in that scenario, what I would do there is I would ask him what he wants doing in relation to signing the project off because you might be investing money into things that is irrelevant to building control. So you need to prioritise what items he wants you to do in the hope that you can get over the line in that sense, which would allow you to get a building control completion certificate. But if the amount of work or the expense of the work that he wants you or she wants you to do is non-achievable, there is another scenario where you could ask the building control officer to write a letter it must be on their headed paper, it must be dated and it must be signed by your building control officer and again must be submitted within three months of the date of the document you're using. And that letter needs to say that the house is habitable, fit for purpose, but cannot be signed off for building control because of the following reasons. HMRC will accept that letter from your building control officer. But as I said, it cannot be an email it can be on PDF and emailed to you, but it cannot be an email written. It must be written on their letter-headed paper, be it the local authority or be it the private building control company. And it must state the date and they must sign it. And it must be a letter, not an email, although it can be emailed to you. Now, when I've done tax before, it's always complicated and I bring in help, but... Can somebody fill all this in themselves or is that in some way likely to lead to them losing money or not getting as much as they think when they put their claim in? OK, so I'm never going to tell anybody that it's not something they can do themselves and it's actually known as the DIY scheme. So that sort of gives you a clue. But although the principle behind the scheme is quite simple, there are pitfalls at every corner. You could still get round it if you have the, the skill set, the time, the energy at the end of the build. If you're comfortable doing it, by all means, yes. If you want the sort of real ins and outs of it, I have a YouTube channel which I do cover the vast majority of these pitfalls in great detail to try and stop people falling down these holes. So I would never say to anybody that you cannot do it yourself. I'd probably describe it as maybe maybe painting the house. It's something you could do yourself, but I'm not quite sure your cutting in would be as good as maybe someone like myself or so forth. So if someone comes to you then to do this as a job within the self-build project, how do you like to work with people? What does it look like in practice? OK, so me personally, I'm quite transparent. I don't mind speaking to people. The policy within the office is sharing knowledge costs nothing. 
We do not ask for any commitment in advance to ring the bill. We certainly don't ask for any money. There's a WhatsApp group or a, my mobile number is available to people and they can ring me, send me photographs of invoices on the WhatsApp group and say, am I safe to pay this? And someone else phones up and says, Peter the plumber's telling me this. I saw on your YouTube video and read in your book that it says this. But Peter's quite adamant. I would then phone Peter and say to him, you know, do you really want to do this job? And he'd be like, oh, yeah, it's a big job. I said, OK, you're not supposed to charge VAT. Oh, my accountant tells me everybody pays VAT. I charge everyone VAT. So I would then say, who's your accountant? Debbie McGowan down in um, in Kent. Right, OK, so what's the accountant called? Oh, Ashford's Accountancy. Right, OK, I'd pick up the phone, I'd get hold of her and say, Peter the Plumber's doing this job. It's under a new build scheme, blah, 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 so on. And get her to acknowledge the scheme and know what I was speaking about and ask her if she would pick up the phone to Peter the Plumber and say, Peter, it's fine not to charge VAT on this project. Once they hear it from their accountant, who they trust, it's like, oh, well, my accountant has said it's OK now. Yes, we'll do that. And it allows the wheels to carry on. So that that's sort of one, one of the many hurdles. Uh, but um, there are certain purchases that are far more difficult to appease HMRC on than others. One of the ones is a kitchen. When you go to buy a kitchen, first of all, you have the hurdle of, are they supplying and fitting it or am I buying it? So then you've got the, is it zero rated or do I pay the VAT and claim it back? Then you have the hurdle of not everything in the kitchen qualifies for VAT exemption or discounted VAT if it's a conversion. The items in the kitchen that do not qualify as a rule, without going into any great detail, are the white goods, the fridge, the freezer, the cooker and so forth. So when you go to buy a kitchen, it's all well and good if you buy it from the likes of We'll say Wren, Howden's is another popular one, Wix is another popular one, whereby you get an itemised bill and a full breakdown of everything you've bought and the cooker was £300 and this was this much and so on and so on. But where you go to more local retailers or where you're dealing with the owner, where it's not maybe not a national company and so on, and nothing wrong with dealing with these types of people, but you get an invoice where it says kitchen for new build. Well, that's no good. HMRC will not reimburse you on that basis because the first thing they're going to say is, are there any white goods? You can't evidence that there are or aren't. So your invoices for your kitchen need to be very detailed in relation to three lengths of three metre worktop at this much cooker at this much, hob at this much, four one-metre cupboards and 1,200 down drawers and so forth. It needs to be broken down in that way in order for HMRC to acknowledge that, yes, that qualifies, yes, that qualifies. No, that doesn't, and no, that doesn't. Is that the only area, then, that we might have items? I'm assuming that's because you could remove them. You could take out a fridge. But are there things like that? Yeah, now then, people are going to say instantly, oh, my kitchen's integral. These rules have never been updated. And when the rules were written in 1977, there was no such thing as integral goods. So they don't acknowledge that these goods even exist. So... The fact that in 1977 we'd have picked the oven up and taken it with us to the next house, they're still of that mindset. Hold on a second. You're saying, has it changed at all since then? No. It's, it's exactly the same since the 70s. 1977. Wow. I'll give you another scenario. All floor covering qualifies except for carpet because in, we'd have rolled carpet up and taken it with us to the next house. Now, in today's world, you're more likely to lift a nice wooden block floor than the carpet but you can actually claim for all floor covering laminate wooden block flooring tiles anything at all except carpet so that brings up another challenge whereby when you go and make purchases especially on a supply and fit basis where you've got a mixture of both so you've got some that qualify for VAT exemption and some that don't and you've got some that 
the labour on one compared to the labour on the other. And all this has to be subdivided, very similar to the kitchen. We'll say a scenario here of floor covering where you've got carpets and we'll say laminate flooring. The bill's 3,000 quid plus fat, but they've supplied and fitted it. So the carpet element would be vatable, as would the labour for laying the carpet, yet the laminate floor and the labour for laying the laminate floor would be VAT exempt because they're supplying and fitting it. But not all of it because the carpet doesn't qualify. So if we put in things, let's say we're doing the return ourselves and yeah. we make a few mistakes and add items that are not included, yeah. what happens under that situation? So, um, depending, HMRC will not accept a claim where you've made no effort. So you're thinking, I'll tell you what, I'll just chuck it all at them and let them sort it out. They won't accept that. They'll send it back to you. Lack of effort, I think they refer to it as. Lack of effort. Yeah. <laughs> right? well, but which is, which is fair I, I, I enough. I understand. Yeah, which is fair enough. Right? The rules are there. You want your money back. You've got to get it right. If you've made a genuine mistake where you didn't realise that an FXF43 was a cooker and you've allowed for it and they pick up on it, they will deduct the value of that from your reclaim. How you do that yourself to present, which is something that we didn't touch on, we'll say for argument's sake, your kitchen invoice, you would put X's at everything that doesn't qualify and then calculate yourself what the new total comes to and then work the VAT out yourself so that on the form you submit to HMRC, you put the amount you're asking for, not what was on the bill. So you're actually writing on the original invoices? Yes, little. yes. You just make notes, XXX against the fridge, the freezer and the built-in microwave, we'll say. And then you work out what that comes to. The challenge there is, if you're not mathematically minded, you need to think of... Those prices, are they inclusive of VAT or are they before the VAT? Is it the bottom total that all that comes to or the total before VAT? So you need to work that out first so you know you're deducting that from which total before you either deduct the VAT back if it's from the very total or you add the VAT to it from the subtotal. Does this become second nature, your business, you're dealing with it so much that it actually becomes quite a quick process? Yes, the setting up of the claim itself is one of the easier challenges. There's about five, six steps. The most difficult challenge is getting full and proper VAT invoices. This is the most time consuming and the most difficult of challenges. I would say on average, the claims coming to us, I would say about 10% of the documents are not VAT invoices. They're order confirmations, priced delivery notes, people have paid bills from quotations, pro formas. None of these are acceptable to HMRC. So if you were to include them, then HMRC would instantly deduct them straight from your bottom line of your claim. How do you then make sure that you've got the correct VAT, just looking at it, making sure it's always... Yeah, most of them should say VAT invoice or something like that on them, where you see it says order confirmation, where you see it says priced delivery note. Oh, it's got the VAT on it there, look. Yeah, it has, but it's still not the proper document. And why can't they accept that? Having a priced document, an order confirmation, anything of that sort, doesn't mean you actually bought it. It's not actual evidence. Quite often, when I get these documents where I said a 200 document claim, 10% of them are not actual invoices, so that's 20 companies to contact, I would probably say three or four of those, they instantly say, well, this never became a sale. You never bought this. And then I take a little video clip of the document or a photograph of the document, WhatsApp it to the client and say, um, did you buy these? Yeah, I'm sure we did. And they're saying, no, oh, I've just asked the wife. No, we didn't. We went somewhere else for it. So um, HMRC do want firm evidence that the item was purchased and even a pro forma. And for those that don't know what a pro forma is, if you go and buy something somewhere and they want to be paid in advance, they won't send you the invoice. They will send you a pro forma, which is technically 
a pre-purchase invoice for want of a better description and quite often people pay that and the supplying company never follow up sending the full VAT invoice so you retain that document and then subsequently you submit it or it comes to us if it comes to us we chase it and get the proper one but you submit the pro forma HMRC short pay you so from what I understand then so far, we're actually going to have quite a, a physically big return that we're submitting. Is that correct? Full of these different invoices and the paperwork? It all depends which way you've gone around building it. And what I mean by that is where I touched on earlier, where people do supply and fit, if it was a new build, it would be zero rated. Well, you wouldn't need to submit those invoices. But if you've been very proactive in purchasing the materials, then yes, a claim could range from 100 documents to, I think we've got one on half at the moment in the office, which is two and a half thousand documents. But that is a super house, mind. It's a castle. <laughs> so, do we expect them to return these in the same time, the two and a half thousand page one compared to the hundred page? Is there a, a limit or does it just get worked through in their own time? Well, it's a bit difficult. If you submit a large claim or a small claim, it gets dealt with in due course, irrespective of the claim value or anything of that sort. Although there are certain more detailed checks done on larger claims in relation to the person submitting the claim your tax position and so on. But in relation to the actual VAT and the claim, there's no bias either way towards big or small claims. But what in relation to how long it actually takes, well, that's quite a long story. But historically, pre-COVID, there was a six-week turnaround. Checking these jobs is very labour intensive. If you imagine that a senior case officer, first of all, has to make sure that your project qualifies. So you need knowledge there. So it can't be done by just an admin person just joined HMRC or a school leaver who can use Excel and a, been on a computer course and so forth. It has to be someone with the right knowledge. There's a limit to how many of those people there are. So in the first instance, it has to be checked by someone to say, yeah, you have a claim that's valid. Then after that, it goes to a member of the team who physically look at your spreadsheet or your written document to say invoice one from X, Y, Z for the value of this. Do we agree? Do all these items qualify? Is the VAT amount the same on the form as what it is on that? Yes, it is. Move on to invoice two, invoice three, so forth. End of the page on invoice 40. Does all that add up correctly? Yes, it does. Is the correct amount put on to the next page as a carry-on? Yes, it is. And so on until you get to the end of the claim. So it's quite labour intensive. So when COVID arrived, it hit this department within HMRC very badly. And it took them until maybe March, April of 2023 to actually recover. Now, over through the summer of 23, they've really caught up and got their act together. And as it stands today, they're actually processing these claims in 10 days. Wow, well, that's, that's a big change. Are there ever any scenarios where people almost get into a dispute? You, you said before how they were expecting one number and then they discover they're not going to be given as much. So this calendar year... I've had two approaches from two different people where they've had their claims refused in their entirety. One was a farmer from North Wales retiring from the farm, built a bungalow for himself and his wife on the land of the farm, and the son was taking over the farm. Now, because he'd been working the farm all his life, born in the farm, he had accounts at Jewson, Travis Perkins and so forth, and he went and used those accounts and he bought the materials and so forth. But all those accounts were in the name of the farm business. Not his name personally. The whole claim was refused. Now, he came to me and after having a bit of a discussion, asking a couple of questions, I realised there was a way out of it. So we met up, he handed over his documents and the refusal letters and so forth. He presented me with his bank statements from his personal account. We resubmitted to HMRC, explained what had happened, evidenced that he had paid for them personally. And thankfully, he had all his money. 
He's a bit unhappy with his accountant because his accountant didn't make him aware of these pitfalls. Now, this is not a criticism of general accountants, but everyone has their place. And just Googling what you can find online about the DIY scheme is not enough knowledge to be acting as a professional in this market. I don't do my own tax return. I get someone who does them every day to do it. And I believe that if you're paying someone to do it, it needs to be someone that does it on a regular basis or you do it yourself. Personally, I'm not keen on the high street accountant or the accountant you've used for your business all your life. And they've always been great unless they're familiar with it and they've given you the do's and don'ts and the pitfalls and everything like this, such as if you're in the building industry, if you're in the construction game, don't use your screw fix account. If you have a property portfolio and it's called XYZ Properties, do not use your screw fix account for XYZ Properties. Open another screw fix account in the name of your wife, if need be, on another email address. It needs to be you yourself. So that's where he caught a cold. The other gentleman, and this is quite recent, he bought a building that had been empty since 1970 and it had been a house. He had planning permission to reinstate, convert the house back. I think it was two houses, a pair of semis historically. He was going to convert it into one new house. So when they started doing the work quite early on, it pretty much started falling apart. It collapsed. And they landed up taking it all the way back down to slab. And it was rebuilt as new. And building control treated it as a new build. In his mind, he also treated it as a new build. The planning permission was to convert, reinstate the dwelling. He submitted it as a new build. HMRC refused his claim. So again, he reached out to me and... Having read his planning, seen what he did, I soon realised that, well, you've put it in in the wrong way. When I approached him and asked him why he did this, he said, well, building control told me it's now being treated as a new build. Building control is not planning. Planning is the key, not building control in relation to the VAT. But his main reason for doing this was because he said, yeah, because a new build is zero and a conversion would have been 5% which goes back to what we touched on earlier in the chat. And when I said to him, well, you would have got the 5% back and it would have become zero, he looked at me as if I had not two heads, but three. Anyway, the good news was, again, we went back to HMRC with the correct documentation, with the evidence, a letter from the local authority saying that the house had been empty since the 70s and HMRC accepted it and paid the claim out in full. So you can only claim one time, but that didn't count as the claim because it was refused. Yes, you, it's not. You submitted, you blew it, you've had it. There is a bit of negotiation, some questions back and forth. There's an appeal service further down the line than that. But when you're waiting on 10, 20, 30, 100,000 pounds and you might be under pressure, from some creditors or you might just have a plan of going around the world trip as I mentioned earlier you know you don't want this taking 12 months you'd rather it take 12 days as it is currently now it feels like we've come across a few of the really important things like that planning permission one are there any other key points that we haven't mentioned well, let me go through them because um, so you need to know which route you're going down does it qualify as a new build or does it qualify as a conversion the invoice is in your name Paying the correct rate of VAT to contractors and keeping the invoices safe, dry and out of sunlight. When I say out of sunlight, some of these, especially builders, merchants, the paper is wafer thin. The ink is as light as it could Invisible be. Invisible ink. Yeah. And you put it on the dash of the car, the van. And you leave it there for a week and all of a sudden you're £50 note. Remember, every invoice is 50 quid. Your £50 note has become toilet roll. How long will it take to receive the money in our bank account? I would envisage, not that I know this for fact, but I believe that they've probably brought extra staff into this team because they were taking 12 months to process these claims. And obviously they've caught up now. I would fully expect 
the original number of people within the team to go back to somewhere along that. So I would expect the claims to go back in the not too distant future to being turned over in four to six weeks. You get the, the invoices that we've submitted or you've submitted to HMRC back in a package in, by Royal Mail. And in there, there is what they call the awards letter, which is a letter saying your claim for XYZ has been passed for payment at, and you hope it says XYZ. But if it says ABC, on the following page, it explains to you why there's a shortfall or why it's not how much you asked for. But that first award of the money would be with you in about a week. I think the letter states 20 days, but it does tend to be far quicker than that. Now, this may be slightly outside your area, but I feel while we're on this topic, I ought to ask it. But we're getting the VAT at zero rate on a new build. Why are we not getting the same on a renovation? So this scheme is in place. Uh, government statistics will tell you that we don't have enough houses in the UK. So the scheme is in place to encourage Mr and Mrs Williams Hop. Davis, Smith and so forth to go and become a self-builder and try and attempt to put them on the same level playing field as your national and um, local building contractors and house builders. So that's the mindset of it. It doesn't actually put you on a level playing field, but obviously it's a great help. So renovating extending and so forth isn't actually creating a new dwelling which is what the government are aiming for so that, that that i believe is the mindset behind it and is there a final thought either repeating something that we've mentioned or something else that might be useful about this whole scheme the two different schemes that we've been talking about today well please make sure you understand which one you qualify under that is the most important thing. Do not get too tunnel visioned into trying to get contractors to do it at zero in relation to getting them to supply materials. If you're really trying to get the costs down, nobody is going to work harder than you in relation to buying the materials. And the purchase of the materials is somewhere that you can save money on. I wouldn't be trying to knock contractors down too much because otherwise you're going to move on to people who do not produce a product that you're happy with or it's not so standard. Good tradesmen do tend to charge a lot of money. If you're really trying to save money, ask them possibly to do labour only and you go and try and source the material. That's where you're going to save money. Andrew, thank you very much. Thanks ever so much for being asked, Ben. Cheers. Get more in our show notes today, which you can find at houseplanninghelp.com slash 340. I mentioned at the beginning of the episode how we anticipate changes soon. Even as we were putting the show notes together, HMRC made those changes. Of course they did. I suppose the major one is that you could now submit your claim online through the government gateway. I imagine that's something that's been in the works for quite some time. I'm sure they wanted to go digital. The second thing is actually something that Andrew mentioned in the interview and suspected that we might be moving to a six month time period. So once you've completed, you've got your house all signed off, you've now got six months. But I think overall, the majority of what we talked about today is still relevant. We'll link you to Andrew's website as well. I'm sure there'll be more information on there today. All that we talked about, houseplanninghelp.com slash 340. My call to action is to check out The Hub. And there's quite an archive accumulating. At the end of every podcast, I normally tell you about something that we've added in there. And so the archive gets bigger and bigger. And it means that you've got more to explore. We do our best every time we put something in. It's not just thrown in. We try and make it as helpful as possible, as we do with the podcast as well. So you've got some complete in-depth video case studies. That's where we follow entire builds and focus on decision making. And you've actually got one which isn't complete with Alex Baines, 
which was interesting, though. We learned a lot from that because there were money issues halfway through. So pretty much the project is still halfway through, but there's a lot to learn from that story. We've got our courses, so they will take you through step by step on different topics. We've got our live training sessions. We've got our members only forum, and that's yet another good source. Just seeing what other people are doing, the challenges that they are coming up against, and how they're getting across and through out the other side. Office Hour gives you a chance to chat to me, ask the expert. We're looking to expand that as well. It's all happening here. Houseplanninghelp.com/slash/join to find out more. That's it for today. Thanks for being here. The House Planning Help podcast is produced by Regen Media, content that matters.